Father, thank you for this powerful chapter that we're continuing through. It makes me thankful for your word and the wonderful way it works in our lives. I pray for all the incredible truths that are contained just in the verses we're looking at this morning to be evident to your people and that you would use all of it to help us understand sin and more importantly resist it. I pray, Lord, that uh, really that the work of the gospel would give us that victory, which makes me beg on behalf of any unbelievers here that they would be saved, that you'd open their hearts to the gospel, because apart from regeneration, there'd be no way for anyone to resist temptation. It's difficult enough even for saved individuals, Lord. And so we do pray for the gospel's uh, empowering to resist sin as we face it, and I pray that you'd use your word to sanctify us into the image and likeness of Christ and to be um, better able to deal with sin. I thank you for how it's personified through the harlot, and just ask that you, all of the power and, and greatness that is behind these verses would be delivered to your people this morning through the work of your Holy Spirit, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, good to, good to see all of you. The title of this morning's sermon is, What Does Sin Do? What Does Sin Do? So if you're new to joining us, we've been working our way verse by verse through Proverbs 7. This is the chapter about the harlot who lures the foolish young man. Listen to this story from radio personality Paul Harvey about how Eskimos kill wolves. He said, first an Eskimo will coat a knife blade with seal blood because seals are easy to trap. And then the Eskimo allows the blood to freeze on the knife and then the Eskimo adds another layer of blood to the knife and then another layer until the blade is completely concealed by frozen blood. Then the hunter fixes his knife in the ground with the blade sticking up. When a wolf follows its sensitive nose to the source of the scent and discovers the bait, it licks the knife, tasting the fresh, frozen blood. The wolf licks the blade more vigorously until the keen edge of the knife is bare, but the wolf doesn't know that the razor-sharp sting of the blade or does not notice the razor-sharp sting of the blade because his tongue is numb from the cold, nor does it recognize that its insatiable thirst is being satisfied by its own warm blood. The wolf's carnivorous appetite just craves more until the dawn finds the wolf dead in the snow. Now this part is, or this account, is grisly, isn't it? But it does illustrate sin's consuming, self-destructive nature. When we see people who are engaged in habitual sin, we could tell them that they need to stop licking the knife. We could even share this story with them and warn them that just like this wolf ended up getting itself killed, the sin that we're habitually engaging in will get us killed. Now, I looked at over 10 websites to determine if Eskimos do this, because as I've told you before, I don't like it when pastors use stories that are not true, which seems to be something that we are famous for doing. And so in my efforts to determine whether this story is true, all of the websites I found, of course, presented the story as being true, but those websites were websites belonging to pastors, or they were websites with sermon illustrations. And so that did not give me a lot of confidence that this is actually how Eskimos kill wolves. I think an even better illustration of sin's destructiveness is found in this morning's verses. So you can swap the wolf for the foolish young man. Like the wolf, he is going to be killed. The foolish young man is because of his desires. Now, if you want to see just how much the foolish young man looks like a wolf or looks like an animal being hunted, you might have noticed during the scripture reading that the foolish young man is compared to what? Three times. An animal. In verses 22 and 23, he's compared to an ox, a stag or deer, and then a bird. But I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We've looked at verses 6 through 17, so we're going to continue at verse 18 this morning. If you want to hear the teaching on verses 6 to 17, you can go back to previous sermons. Look with me at verse 18. We have reached the harlot speaking to the foolish young man. So she says to him, Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Now twice, in the same sentence, the harlot mentions the word love. And I just want to ask you, does she love this young man? No, she definitely does not. This is a lie 
She's known him for a few minutes, it seems, yet she talks to him about love. She would have said these exact same words to any young man, which makes her like any prostitute or like any woman on the internet who is trying to entice a young man but has absolutely no concern for him. But this is what sin does, and this brings us to lesson one. Sin lies to us. Lesson one, sin lies to us. Take your mind back to the fall. God said, Genesis 2, 17, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And then when the devil tempted Eve, what did he say? So God says you're going to eat from this and you're going to die, and then what did the devil say? Genesis 3, 4, you will not surely die. So the devil told Eve the exact opposite of what God said. Sin does the same with us. Listen to these verses, Romans 7, 11. Sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So Paul said that sin deceived him. Hebrews 3, 13. Exhort one another daily, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So sin deceives us, sin lies to us. We're even told that we should be exhorting each other daily to be prevented from being deceived by sin. Now, what are some of the lies that sin would tell us? Well, sin will tell us this isn't going to hurt you. This isn't going to ruin your family. This isn't going to cost you that relationship. This isn't going to become an addiction. How many people who have become addicted to something would have engaged in that sin if they would have known it was going to be an obsession or addiction that ruins their life. Sin likes to tell us you're going to be able to stop whenever you want, which is a way I think sin appeals to our pride. You're different than the other people who have had this problem. These other people weren't able to stop, but you're stronger than them. And there's one lie in particular that sin always tells us, and it's the lie contained in verses 19 and 20, if you look there with me. So the harlot personifying sin and temptation, she says, my husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. So one of the things you notice is that right after telling this young man how much she loves him, unbelievably, you learn that she has a husband. Now, up to this point, you wouldn't have thought she had a husband. If not for this verse, we would have read this account and assumed that she was an unmarried prostitute. But now we learn that she's the wife of some poor man, and when he goes out of town, then she goes out on the hunt. So she says her husband's gone, but that's not really the point. The point she's trying to communicate is that he's going to be able to do this, and he's not going to be caught. Nobody is going to find out. And this brings us to lesson two. Sin says you won't get caught. This is one of the main lies that sin tells us. You won't get caught. And if you think about it for a moment, this is probably the one lie above all others that we must believe when we commit sin. We must be convinced that nobody's going to know. We're going to be able to get away with this. That's exactly what the harlot was telling the foolish young man. What person would have stolen, or what person would have committed adultery, or what person would have lied, or what person would have gossiped if they thought they would be caught? If you look back at verse 9, this is why the young man went out at twilight in the evening at the time of night and darkness, because he didn't what? He didn't want anyone to see him. He didn't want anyone to know what he was doing. But as we've talked about before, was there someone who knew what he was doing? We're actually told that right at the beginning of the count, that someone was watching him. Look at verse 6. At the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice, and I've seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense. So before he does anything else, we're told that there was someone watching him. And who does this individual looking down at him represent? This is God. And so what's the point? The point is, no matter who we might ever be able to hide our sin from, no matter who we might ever be able to deceive, God is always looking down or looking out, aware of what we're doing. Might be able to hide it from everyone else, but we can't hide it from God. 
And this is why we read Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Now, there are not many verses in Scripture that tell us not to be deceived. By my count, there's only four of them, and this is one of them. And it's interesting to me to read a verse telling us not to be deceived, because you would almost think that that's either unnecessarily said, or it is unnecessarily said because it applies to every verse. Every verse is helping us not to be deceived. Every verse is giving us truth that would counter or contradict lies that we would be told or tempted to believe. So why would there even be a need for a verse to tell us not to be deceived? Well, my belief is because this must be an area of particular temptation to be deceived. Or in other words, we're told not to be deceived regarding an area where there's a particularly strong temptation for us to be deceived. And in this case, it says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, whatever one sows that he will also reap. And so there seems to be a very strong temptation for us to believe that first, God can be mocked, and then second, that we are going to be able to sow without reaping. So we just want to make sure that we're not deceived about either of these. God will not be mocked. We will suffer for the sin we commit. We will reap what we've sown. One more verse along these lines, Numbers 32, 23. Behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. To me, this is similar to Galatians 6 because it begins with the word behold, which almost seems like another word that wouldn't be necessary because really we're to behold everything in Scripture. There are no verses that we're to overlook or to ignore, so why would it be necessary for there to even be the word behold associated with any verses? Well, my suspicion is because this is something that God particularly wants to make sure that we don't miss, or one time we're supposed to pay special attention. We are to behold that our sin will find us out. And one of the obvious questions is, how do we explain individuals who seem to be able to sin, or let's say it like this, well, without God finding out, or let's say they seem to be able to sow without also reaping? Well, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that God is just being merciful and he's allowing time for what? Repentance, confession, before he has to discipline, right? Now, there's always this temptation to believe that when we have sinned or done something wrong and we haven't been disciplined, or at least not disciplined yet, that either God hasn't noticed or God doesn't care or maybe what we did wasn't really that bad. When the reality of the situation is God is just mercifully giving us time to repent before he has to discipline us. And that's the better of the two possibilities. The other possibility, when people seem to be able to, for lack of a better way to say it, get away with sin, is that those people are not what? They're not God's children. They're not Christians. That's not my opinion. This is exactly what Hebrews 12 says to us. Hebrews 12, 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So, how should we actually feel when we're disciplined by God for our sin? We're grateful, loved, we can have confidence in our salvation, that we are God's children, that he is drawing us, as it goes on to discuss, to produce the fruits of righteousness. So God's discipline, like a parent's discipline, is a wonderful thing. Now, I want to give you an example of what we're discussing, which resembles this account. The foolish young man is tempted to commit adultery because he's convinced that the woman's husband is out of town. Can you think of another individual in the Old Testament who was tempted to commit adultery because her husband was away? Similarly, David was tempted to commit adultery with Bathsheba when he learned that her husband Uriah was away at battle. David thought that he would not be caught. And did it look like David wasn't going to be caught? Yeah, it looks like he got away with it. I mean, he got a little nervous there when she was pregnant but then he was able to hide his adultery with another sin, murder. 
he seems to have successfully covered up these two incredibly grievous sins. Nobody is the wiser. And in fact, David even went on to look like, at least in the eyes of the ancient world, where having multiple wives was acceptable, a good or honorable man, because what did he do with this widow? He took Bathsheba and makes her his wife. And so he looks like this very caring king who reaches out to the pregnant wife of one of his fallen soldiers. And all of this is recorded in 2 Samuel 11. And here's what's interesting. And just to make sure I wasn't missing anything, I went through the entire account. The other day, there's no mention of God. There's no mention of the Lord. There's no indirect references to God. You can read the entire chapter and you will not find anything hinting at the Lord's presence which makes sense because it's an incredibly dark chapter that has nothing to do with God. You get to the very end, the last verse, and it says this, 2 Samuel eleven twenty-seven. 27, David sent, he brought Bathsheba to his house, she became his wife, she bore him a son, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Or in other words, in the language of Proverbs 7, verse 6, The Lord is looking down or out and seeing what's happened. And so no matter how many people David might have been able to hide his sin from, he could not hide it from the Lord. Everything looked good for him. People are impressed with him, pleased with his goodness or kindness. But then God tells us how displeased he is. In the next chapter, he sends Nathan the prophet to confront David and tell him the sword will not depart from his house, and he spent the rest of his days suffering the consequences of his sin, even though he had been forgiven. So just like God was looking down on the foolish young man, God's looking down on David. God wasn't going to be mocked. David's sin was going to find him out. David was going to reap what he had sown. Now, I want to conclude this lesson with this. It is important to remember that even if we think, my wife won't find out, my husband won't find out, my children won't find out, my parents won't find out. My friends won't find out. And I'll just say, we talked a lot about pornography or the struggle that young men have. And because this sermon applies to everyone, I didn't ask the, did not ask the young men to sit up front this Sunday. But you need to know, when you get married, and if the Lord blesses you with children, you want to be able to live an upright life as a married man, as much as, as a single man. You want your wife to be able, just for example, just even, and here's an example this morning in the foyer, Katie says, can I record the choir? Can I use your phone for that? You want your wife to always be able to look at your phone or look at your messages or look at your computer. You want your children to be able to look over your shoulder and to see what's on your screen. And so the uprightness you're striving to demonstrate as a young man is, never, is always a necessity. It isn't ever something that you outgrow. You'll have a wife and children that you'll want to be upright before as well. So remember that even if you think your parents won't find out, your friends won't find out, your boss won't find out, your church won't find out, God sees what we do. And there's never any panic around the throne room of God associated with exposing someone's sin right? God never says, oh, you know what? This person has hidden this sin so well, I do not know how I'm going to bring it to the light of day. There's absolutely no problem for him exposing any sort of wickedness that he wants addressed in our lives. Because the foolish young man thought that he wouldn't be caught, he gave in. Look at verse 21. says, with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver, and as a bird rushes into a snare. Now what's interesting is throughout this account, the harlot to me looks like a hunter pursuing prey. I mean, you could read that. You could go through each of these verses and compare her with a hunter looking for a victim or prey. But then you don't even have to wonder that any longer because you reach these verses and she's shown to be the hunter. The foolish young man is shown to be an animal being hunted. I used to teach fifth grade, which is when students, or at least in California, learn about similes. 
And I always told my students that similes compare two things using the words like or as. And so you can recognize similes when you see something is said to be like something else or something is said to be as something else. And I mention that because there are three similes in two verses. Proverbs 7.22, the foolish young man, as an ox, as a stag, as a bird. Now, why does God go to such lengths to compare this foolish young man with animals? I mean, of all the things God can compare the foolish young man to, why does he choose to compare the foolish young man to animals? The answer is simple, but it's also profound. And this brings us to lesson three. Sin makes us more like animals. Sin makes us more like animals. Consider this verse I brought up a few times in this chapter because I think it's looking to Proverbs 7, and that's James 1.14. Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Desires are one of the similarities that we have with animals. Animals have desires, humans have desires. And some of the desires that animals and humans have are the same. Animals and humans desire food, desire shelter, desire to protect their offspring. We'll even talk about mothers that are super protective and compare them with what? With bears. Animals and humans desire relationships. Animals and humans suffer when they don't have relationships. But one of the main differences between animals and humans is humans have the potential to do what with their desires? Control them or resist them. I mean, that's what makes, we'll even refer to humans as animals when they don't resist or attempt to control their desires, but to give themselves over to them. When we don't control our desires, when we give in to them, to satisfy them in sinful ways, we're acting more like animals than humans. Listen to this quote from Warren Wiersbe. He said, the young man began to act like an animal. He was no longer acting like a young man made in the image of God. Humans are the only creatures in God's creation who can choose what kind of creatures they're going to be. God wants us to be sheep, but he has given us other options. We can be like horses or mules. Psalm 32, 9, do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit or bridle, or it will not stay near you. We can be like dogs or pigs. 2 Peter 2, 22, what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit after the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. When we live outside the will of God, we lose our privileges as humans made in God's divine image. Now, when this young man decided to live outside God's will and go with this woman, he looks less like God and he looks more like an animal, just being controlled or being given over to the satisfying of his desires. Few things look as much like God as self-control, patience. I mean, it's one of the fruit of the Spirit, right? It is something that would be produced, or the Holy Spirit would produce in our lives that allows us to look more like the Lord when we do control ourselves. When we give in to the lust of the flesh to satisfy our desires, we look less like God and more like animals. And there's another reason the foolish young man is compared with animals. Animals are hunted, and this foolish young man is being hunted. Look back at verse 23. It says, till an arrow pierces its liver. Till an arrow pierces its liver. Now, I think most of you know Katie and I grew up together in the mountains of Northern California. I think we had about 30-something people in my graduating class. There's a the huge Fall River Valley just, you know, stretched on for hundreds of miles, and there was, like, not a lot of people living near each other. And so... Two of the most common activities are fishing and hunting. My father-in-law, Rick, he, I don't know how many antlers, sets of antlers he has in his house. I don't think it's quite as many as he used to have because when he married Kathleen, it seems like she thought many of them belong out in the shop and not in the house. But anyway, you can see how much hunting he's done. And it's one of the more common recreational activities where we grew up. When I was young, I remember deer hunting with my father and grandfather. I don't know if I've ever told you guys before, how many bucks that I've killed in my life? None. Okay? But I do remember being told where you're supposed to aim 
when you're shooting at a buck. Between the chest and the neck, and then you have the greatest chance of hitting the deer's heart. I remember being told that even if I hit the buck some other place, then the buck would be able to run off, and even if it died somewhere else, there's a good chance that I would never see it again. So when I read verse 23, it isn't what I expect. Why does it say that an arrow pierces the liver versus piercing the heart? Does God not know the best way to kill an animal? <laughs> I mean, I was thinking, well, at the end of Job, God describes his familiarity with all the animals, he's, or not all of them, but lots of animals that he's created, right? And he, he even condemns Job and says, do you have my wisdom of, of the natural realm and familiarity with all of these animals that I do? And so we can be sure that God knows the fastest way for a hunter to kill an animal. So why does it say that this arrow pierces its liver? It is worded this way for a reason. The reason is that if it said an arrow pierced the heart, it's going to be an immediate and relatively painless death. But that's not what sin does. Sin doesn't kill us mercifully. Sin kills us mercilessly. Sin provides a very slow and agonizing death, and that's what's in view. And this brings us to lesson four. Sin produces a slow, painful death. We'll probably talk about this a little more in the next sermon when we finish this chapter. But when sin produces a death, let's say the death of a marriage, because if we, I say the word death and immediately you think physical death. Someone breathes their last breath. That's not necessarily what's in view. The more common death or deaths that sin produces are the deaths of relationships, or the deaths of marriages, or the death of your finances, or the death of your health, the death of your job. So, Pierce, and so when those deaths occur, are they quick? Did that marriage end quickly? No, these are very long, slow, gruesome, agonizing deaths, and that's what sin wants to do with us. Piercing the liver would be a mortal wound. If an arrow pierced an animal's liver, that animal is still going to die. But the main difference is it's going to be a long, slow, painful death. Here's what I read. A liver shot is a punch, kick, or knee strike to the right side of the rib cage that damages the liver. Blunt force to the liver can be excruciatingly painful. And an especially effective shot will incapacitate a person instantly. Thus, in combat sports, liver shots often result in technical knockouts. So I went to the internet and I looked up videos of liver shots. And I was surprised, having no experience in UFC myself, to see two men pummeling each other, punching, kicking, the head, the side, the stomach, repeatedly. I think rounds last five minutes. What are there, three rounds? So it's probably at least half as difficult as wrestling. <laughs> okay. So I'm watching these UFC fighters going after each other, just pounding each other. And one liver shot drops these men. I mean, it's really kind of something to see. Just one shot to the liver. I mean, these guys can take a bunch of pounding to the head, but a shot to the liver drops them in excruciating pain. You see them just crouched on the mat and they can't continue. And even the times that they do stand up after a liver shot, they usually can't continue and have to stop anyway because the pain continues. Why am I accentuating this? Because this is what scripture accentuates. Because scripture associates sin with piercing the liver. The painfulness, the agonizingness, the slow death Finally, look at the end of verse 23. He does not know that it will cost him his life. This is one more similarity with animals. Animals don't know they're about to die, right? They don't even know that they're being hunted. And that is the case with a foolish young man. 
He didn't know he was about to die. He had no idea he was being hunted by this woman. Or you could say he had as much idea that he was being hunted as an animal does. He is as ignorant or oblivious as the animals that are mentioned. And this brings us to the next lesson. Sin hunts the foolish, lesson five. Sin hunts the foolish. If you write in your Bible, you might circle, underline, highlight the words, he does not know. Because these are some of the best words in Scripture describing almost everyone when we give in to temptation. The foolish young man didn't know it would cost him his life. For many others, when we sin, we didn't know that it's going to cost us what? I mean, you name it. There are a few things that sin won't take from us. I, I, if I say sin will take what? Fill in the blank. I mean, I don't know you could have a wrong answer. Sin will take your marriage, take your children, job, finances, health. One of the more common things I see, especially with pornography, is self-respect. It takes a toll on people. It seems to be very difficult for any man looking at pornography to respect himself because he recognizes that he's being controlled by something. I think that's God has made men to be leaders, leaders in the church, leaders in the home, and it is hard for a man to lead. It is hard for a man to respect himself when he recognizes his weakness associated with being controlled in this area. So sin destroys self-respect. There's almost nothing that sin will not take from us. And in every one of those situations, if you talk to the people, they would say, I didn't know. So when this verse says, he does not know, that perfectly describes what happens when we sin. To drive the point home, the animals are described as oblivious. To picture the young man's, you know, God doesn't really care here about us learning about animals, right? He doesn't mention them here so we have more familiarity with the animal kingdom. He mentions them because their oblivion, obliviousness pictures the young man's obliviousness. First, he's like an ox that has no idea it's about to be slaughtered. He's like a deer that's completely unsuspecting. He's like a bird that has no idea it's flying into a trap. And this is what ignorance looks like, and there's application for us. We can be ignorant of sin's consequences. We think nothing will happen. And when we're ignorant or oblivious, when we think nothing will happen, it makes us like, or we're showing, we are showing, it doesn't make us like, we are showing that we are like the dumb ox, or we're like the unsuspecting deer, or we're like the senseless bird, or we're like the foolish young man. Think about this. In verses 22 and 23, why is there an emphasis on snares or traps? Because sin is what? It's a snare. It is a trap. You've got a stag that's caught fast in a trap. You've got a bird that's caught in a snare. Because sin is a snare. Sin is, sin traps us. I'll reference James 1.14 one more time. Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. The Greek word for enticed, it's della aidza, and interestingly, it's a fishing term. So when it says each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire, the word for enticed is a fishing term that means to bait or to catch by bait. And this brings us to lesson six. Sin is a baited hook. Sin is a baited hook. So I also did some fishing when I was growing up. Let me remind, or let me tell you how many, time, how many fish I caught. One. I tricked you. You thought I was going to say zero, but I did catch a fish one time. Out of years of fishing, I have one one fish on my record. Now, there's two reasons that when we fish, we use bait. And it's the same two things sin does. We use bait for the same reasons that sin does. First, to attract to attract the fish. There's no fish that's going to bite a hook without bait on it. And sin works the same way. There's got to be sin offers something attractive. or There's no way that's how it entices us, right? In the language of James 1.14, we're lured and enticed by something attractive. The second reason that a fisherman uses bait is to hide the hook. 
And this is exactly what sin does. It hides the hook or it hides the fact that it's going to lead to pain, regret, even death. That's one of the worst parts of sin. We do not see it for what it is. Listen to this quote from J.C. Ryle, who is becoming one of my favorite writers. He said, We're too apt to forget that temptation to sin will rarely present itself to us in its true colors. Sin doesn't say, I am your deadly enemy. I want to ruin you forever in hell. Oh no, sin comes to us, like Judas, with a kiss. The forbidden fruit seemed good and desirable to Eve, yet it cast her out of Eden. Look back at verse 23. This is why it says, The foolish young man does not know that it will cost him his life. In other words, he saw the bait, but he didn't see what? <laughs> he didn't see the hook. No matter how strong the foolish young man's desires were, if he knew it was going to cost him his life, would he have gone with the harlot? Of course not. So we can see why he gave in. He saw the bait, but he didn't see the hook. And I want to give you two examples of how sin approaches us. We won't turn back to Proverbs 7. You can turn to the left to 2 Samuel 3. Turn to 2 Samuel 3. J.C. Ryle, in his quote, he personified sin to us. He personified the way sin approaches us. He said it's like Judas, and Judas approaches with what? A kiss. I want to personify sin also for you. I hope these images might stay in your mind. I think that's why God uses such powerful imagery in Scripture. It's easier to remember. It makes such an impression on us. In 2 Samuel 3, I want to briefly explain the two men we're going to meet. There's Joab. Joab is David's nephew, and he was also his great general. I say he was a great general because there is no record of Joab ever losing a battle, despite all of the fighting that David engaged in with, with Joab leading the troops. But Joab was incredibly ruthless. He was ambitious. He was willing to help David murder Uriah. My suspicion, besides the fact that Joab was a man without morals, is he wanted to remain um, endeared to David. And he knew that if David was to lose the throne, that that would mean losing his position or power as the general of the army. So David says, murder this man, and Joab goes along with it. Later, Joab even betrayed David. When David's son Adonijah took the throne, Joab thought that if this is the new king, you know, forget David, I'll go with Adonijah. So that's how ruthless and ambitious Joab is. The other individual in this account is Abner. Now, just as Joab is David's general, Abner was Saul's general. But when Saul died, his general Abner came and joined David. Now, when Abner joined David, how do you think Joab felt about that? How do you think Joab felt about the enemy general coming and joining David? He viewed him as what? He viewed him as a threat. He wants to keep his control over the army, and he's concerned that maybe Abner will get some of that power or authority. So look in 2 Samuel 3, verse 27. When, and this is how sin approaches us. When Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the midst of the gate to speak with him privately. So it looks like all Joab wants to do is talk privately with Abner. And there he struck him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. And to me, that looks exactly like the way that sin approaches us. We're completely unsuspecting, like the foolish young man with the harlot, like the animal stepping into the traps, like the fish biting the hook, but then just mercifully, mercilessly, excuse me, Joab murders him, and that's what sin, des sin desires to do with us. Turn to 2 Samuel 20. 2 Samuel 20. And while you turn there, we're going to meet someone else in this chapter, and his name is Amasa. Amasa is another of David's nephews, which also makes him one of Joab's cousins, because Joab was also David's nephew. David's rebellious son Absalom appointed Amasa as general over the army when he took the throne from David. 
So Joab also sees, now that Absalom is out of the picture, Joab also sees Amasa, Absalom pre, Absalom's previous general, as a threat as well. Look in chapter 20, verse 9. Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? How does Joab sound? <laughs> Friendly, inviting, interested, perhaps even kind. Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him, just like Judas with Jesus. Just like the harlot approaching the foolish young man. If you remember from Proverbs 7, the harlot goes up to the young man and incredibly aggressively kisses him. He's using these friendly, flattering words, followed by a kiss. The way that sin approaches us, friendly, flattering, attractive. Joab grabs Amasa by the beard to give him the kiss of greeting. And then with Amasa, completely unsuspecting, listen to what Joab does with his other hand, verse 10. Amasa did not observe the sword that was in Joab's hand. So Joab struck him with it in the stomach, spilled his entrails to the ground without striking a second blow, and he died. And the reason I thought of this account is because Amasa, he didn't see the hook, did he? It says that Amasa couldn't see that sword, the hook behind the bait, and that's how sin approaches us hiding the sword, hiding the hook, using friendly words, looking warm, looking inviting with every desire to kill us. Consider this famous quote, sin will take you farther than you want to go, it will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. I want to conclude by showing you a verse in 1 Thessalonians 1, if you'd turn there, please. This will be the last place we turn, 1 Thessalonians 1. First Thessalonians 1. And while you turn there, I'll just share this with you. In this sermon, we've talked much about sin or talked much about what sin does. Sin lies to us. Sin tells us we won't get caught. Sin makes us act more like animals. Sin produces a slow, painful death. Sin hunts the foolish. Sin is like a baited hook. But I would say that all of those threats don't reveal the greatest reason we should avoid sinning. Our greatest motivation to resist sin shouldn't be because of any of those dangers. Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities, your sin, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. The greatest reason that we shouldn't sin is because sin does what? It separates us from God. The worst thing sin does is separates us from God. That's the biggest reason we should resist it. Now hold on to that, because I want to share something about the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians seem to be the greatest church in the New Testament. If there's a church that we would want to be like as a church, it would be the Thessalonian church. Paul had no problems rebuking churches or people in churches it's in fact the thessalonians are unless i'm missing something the only church that paul had no rebukes for which tells me or tells all of us how solid of a church it was all he had for the thessalonians were compliments commendations at least part of the thessalonians godliness must have been associated with their ability to resist sin And look what Paul said to them in verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. And then here it is. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Notice he said you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, am I the only one that thinks this verse is not worded the way that we would expect generally we think overcoming sin happens in a different order you turn from sin to god what did the thessalonians do they turned to god 
from sin. So the Thessalonians knew that their sin separated them from God. And they overcame sin by focusing first on their relationship with the Lord. It's interesting. They turned from sin second. The first thing they did was turn to God, focus on their relationship with Him. And then from that came their victory over idols. Now, hopefully, our biggest fear is also that sin separates us from God, from our Creator, from our Father, who loves us. The way to have victory over sin is to first look to God, not in our own effort try to turn from the sin apart from the Lord, but it's that investment in our relationship with the Lord, the growth with our creator who loves us that allows us to overcome sin a god who loves us according to romans 8 38 and 39 so much that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from him and that's why biblically counseling someone about sin involves moving from the horizontal to the vertical, right? To help people overcome sin requires pointing them toward the Lord. If they're going to be able to turn from that sin, they're going to have to first turn to the Lord and grow in this vertical relationship before they're going to have any victory in that horizontal relationship. So we should resist sin for many reasons, but first and foremost, because it separates us from God, and focusing on turning to God will help us develop victory. If you have any questions or I can pray for you in any way, I'll be up front after service, and I'd consider it a privilege to speak with you. Father, I thank you for these verses. I thank you for this revelation of what sin does. I pray that we would be reminded of these truths whenever we find ourselves tempted, sobered to the reality of what sin wants to do with us. And I would pray that we would seek victory by growing in our relationships with you, that it wouldn't be entirely about our human human effort, but would be about pursuing you and turning to you, following the example that the Thessalonians set, and then only secondarily turning from the sin. We thank you for the gospel's work in our lives to empower us to be able to resist sin. And again, I would pray for anyone who'd be with us that's not a believer, Lord, that you would open their hearts to the gospel regenerate them, bring them to life spiritually, because apart from that, none of us can have any victory. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.